Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for a program that could save your life and the lives of those you love. The odds that you are in danger at this very moment are forbidding perilously near half of Arkansans, 18 or older, more than four in 10, have hypertension, commonly referred to as high blood pressure, and fewer than half are doing much, if anything, about it. In fact, health experts tell us that scores of thousands of Arkansans with hypertension don't know it. They feel fine, or think they do, and then the roof collapses. No other state, none, has a higher heart attack mortality rate than Arkansas, and only four other states have a higher incidence of death by stroke. And then there are other related maladies, kidney disease, loss of vision, even sexual dysfunction. The loss of lives and productivity, the drain on public and private accounts need not be. In the minutes to come, some answers from some experts. Dr. Apatarai Bala, Chronic Disease Director of the Arkansas Department of Health. Christine Sassy, the department's nutritionist consultant. Sharonda Love is Director of the Arkansas Minority Health Commission. And Nancy Grayson is the American Heart Association's Senior Director of Multicultural initiatives. This is your program. We want to hear your questions, your comments, and our phone volunteers are standing by to take your calls. Toll-free message, 1-800-662-2386. You may email a question to paffairs at aetn.org, or you can Twitter hashtag ARASK, and of course we'll continue to provide that information at the bottom of your screen during the course of the broadcast. So please, your questions and our thanks once again, as always, to volunteers from the Arkansas State Employees Association for for manning our telephones. Dr. Bala, welcome back. And, yeah, and let's start you. here. When we talk about hypertension, we're talking about a range of related ailments. I mean, mm -hmm. we think of high blood pressure, well, heart attack, stroke, but as I indicated earlier, it's far beyond that. The complications, mm -hmm. the maladies that are conducive to that or stem from that are, are several. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, thank you for having us. And uh, um, there is no other health threat to Arkansans than high blood pressure or hypertension. And the Center for Disease Control calls it uh, the public enemy number two right after tobacco. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, half of Arkansans uh, have high blood pressure or hypertension. And uh, it is a systemic disease and it can affect the heart, the kidneys, um, the vision, and also uh, pretty much any part of the body. And as you alluded to, Arkansas ranks number one in heart attack deaths in the nation and that is pretty daunting uh, statistics. How did we get there, anybody? How did we get to be number one in heart attack morbidity? Why are these numbers so high? Why here? Well, there are, the causes are multifactorial, and part of it uh, has been uh, referred to as the southern uh, uh, culture or uh, the when we mean, uh, mean by southern culture are the food we eat uh, and the environment uh, we live in, um, you know, uh, high blood pressure uh, doesn't happen overnight. And uh, part of it is the diet, you know, the, the high salt diet. Of course, in South, we like our fried food. We foods. like to fry stuff in the exactly. South, in other words. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, perhaps the others could add in. Uh, Another fa uh, yes, another factor in that is with uh, being such a rural state, our access to healthy foods, fresh fruits, vegetables can be very limited, especially among our Kansans without the ability to um, drive to a super center, uh, easily access a farmer's market. Uh, there are fewer choices and that it just uh, compounds itself. As children are growing up in these communities without proper food access, they're not learning to like the taste of the foods. It takes many exposures to a new food to learn to like it for children. And if they don't like it, they may not grow up learning to cook it, and it just uh, magnifies itself. It's yeah. 
Please. And I think in addition to what Christine and Dr. Bala said, there's also um, awareness mm -hmm. of hypertension as well as access to preventive screenings. And that's one of the major focuses for the Minority Health Commission. We provide sponsorships to community entities, churches, schools to get those screenings out to those that need it so that they can be aware if they have it and get treatment. Can we measure the gap? And I know it is particularly acute among people of color in Arkansas and across the South. What, where's the gap here? What can we do? Why that gap and what can be done to narrow it? Christine made a good point. Yeah. We have access issues with uh, minority African Americans. We see a 40% gap mm -hmm. from their non-white Hispanic counterparts and their uh, white counterparts. And so their, their cultural um, differences. We in the South, we fry everything and we do what we learn from our ancestors. And so those genetic and um, behavioral um, aspects of our lives can affect our, our lifestyles and, and blood pressure. Well, I, the, too, this is a public policy question that strikes me as, and I don't want to get into the politics of it, or maybe we should. I don't know. I'll let you decide. And that is in terms of access to primary health care, uh, individuals not being in a position to see a clinician who can say, whoa, wait a minute, you're off the charts. We, you've got to make some changes in your lifestyle. Yeah. I or mean, you need medications. Sure, absolutely. I mean, the problem is essentially twofold. One is access to primary care to check blood pressure for diabetes and other chronic diseases. The other part is, uh, um, you know, hypertension is referred to as silent killer. And which means that uh, an individual co can go for years without having any symptoms. And when they do have, uh, it's pretty bad. So uh, there is a lack Before of- Before it hurts, it has to be pretty bad. I mean, exactly. you advanced, okay. Exactly, so uh, there's a lack of awareness as well. And uh, oftentimes these things creep up during the adulthood and uh, uh, many adult or cancers um, remain undiagnosed and undetected. So that is a huge problem. And part of it may be access. The other part of it is uh, lack of awareness that they need to go check uh, they are with their doctor, uh, uh, how is their blood pressure, how is their cholesterol and diabetes and so forth. So uh, it's a twofold problem essentially is uh, while we have the issues about access, there is a lot of uh, problem with the access to care as well. Um, I mentioned that uh, about 40 to 50 percent of <coughs> adult Arkansans have high blood pressure or hypertension, but uh, our statistics show that another 10 to 20 percent remain uh, undiagnosed but they have hypertension so uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, groundwork um, need to be put in place let me bring miss grayson in on this absolutely and one of the things that we have to be aware of even with uh, what christine was talking about um, this state we have very high rates of uh, childhood obesity and we are finding that our children have these adult onset illnesses that you're finding children that are in their teens that are hypertensive and if that in is... In their teens? Absolutely. Yes. yes. And uh, when you look at subsets of the population like the African Americans who are the most hypertensive individuals anywhere in the world and uh, so like uh, Dr. Bala was talking about there is need for a multi-prong approach where you putting the community to account and also the healthcare providers where they should work as teams. And again, the thing is hypertension is asymptomatic. You don't know you have hypertension until you get it checked. And the American Heart Association has resources. We have a program called Check, Change, Control. And what we are seeing, um, we when people start checking their numbers, they know where they are and we're seeing a lot of improvement and even dropping your blood pressure numbers by 10 points, you can drastically reduce your risk by 30 to 50 percent and almost eliminate uh, your risk for dying of a stroke or a heart attack because hypertension is a huge risk factor. So there are all these compounded things, but there is definitely need for the community and the providers and policymakers to work 
together to address this scourge that is decimating our communities. We, we have some uh, artwork, I think, a graphic that, that we'll pull up in a second, but I, I want to go back, if I can, to something you mentioned. It went, when an adolescent or a teenager presents mm -hmm. with early stage hypertension, what are you dealing with here? Uh, environmental, diet, or uh, to what extent do genetics play a role? Uh, I could uh, if, in a youngster that in an individual that age. Yeah, and uh, while hypertension uh, has some genetic component, particularly uh, among African Americans, have uh, increased propensity to develop hypertension. Most of it uh, is uh, secondary to lifestyle. Uh, lifestyle choices one makes either it is uh, you know the high salt food or lack of physical activity or uh, smoking which is a big risk factor for uh, high blood pressure or hypertension and uh, alcohol consumption so uh, it is essentially multifactorial while um, a small proportion uh, is played by genetics, there is a huge role on the lifestyle modification or the lifestyle choices one makes. Well, you, uh, earlier in the broadcast you mentioned that uh, uh, hypertension is public health enemy number two, mm -hmm. number one being tobacco. It would, yeah. it would appear that they're, they're linked mm -hmm. directly. I mean, they're, they're almost one and the same. Aren't they? that, that's, that's true. Uh, tobacco uh, is you know, as we all know, we have a huge problem. We have about 25% of adult Arkansans who smoke. And uh, what happened uh, in the last uh, 20, 30 years, uh, that's been compounded by, the, by, by our poor diet intake and also lack of physical activity. So you have a combination of tobacco use, poor diet intake, and uh, lack of physical activity created this uh, problem of uh, uh, high blood pressure or hypertension. Yeah, Ms. Grayson, I think we've got your graphic up now if you want to kind of walk us through that. Sure. Or we're about to bring it up anyway. If you can walk us through that. Um, yes, one of the things is how to take blood pressure correctly because the way you start managing your blood pressure is knowing where where you are. And uh, we have different levels. Uh, there are people who are normal, then there's the prehypertensive stage, and um, the, depending on where you are, whether you are in normal, prehypertension, hypertension stage one, hypertension stage two, or crisis stage, uh, most people think just because their blood pressure is normal that they don't need to track their blood pressure. We need to get into the habit of tracking blood pressure. You find that there are some things that people do, for instance, intake of high uh, foods with high sodium that can spike your blood pressure so if you are in the habit of taking your blood pressure on a daily basis or every other day uh, and you see a spike you can look back and say what's happening here and then when you look at what you're eating that will give you cues that probably what you're eating is spiking your blood pressure again if you are pre in, in the prehypertensive stage and you know it you can work towards moving towards the normal. But if you don't know that, then it's easily for you to slide down to stage one, stage two, and probably get into the hypertensive crisis. And that's where, like Dr. Bala was talking about, you're stroking out or you're having a massive heart attack. Um, so th there are these things that, and also knowing how to take blood pressure correctly, we're finding that when people even go to the doctor's office, Sometimes your feet are da dangling in the air, you, you're not resting your arm, you just walked in and people are even afraid with that white coat syndrome. And there are also proper ways and it's not unusual to go into a clinic and they're not measuring your blood pressure correctly. And when that's not happening, that means they are not going to address that problem. So also on the part of the care, healthcare providers, we need to work with them to make sure that they are taking those numbers correctly. And then when you find out where you are, then there are ways. It's either you get on medication and you ad uh, also adhere to lifestyle changes, which includes reducing sodium, adopting a healthy diet, um, physical activity, alcohol uh, consumption, uh, at least moderating that, and also smoking, like 
which is a huge, huge, huge problem. So it's knowing where you are, and once you know where you are, then taking the proper steps. It could be a combination of medication and lifestyle changes. And again, like Dr. Bala was talking about, 80% of illnesses can be modified by lifestyle changes. Maybe 20% we can't mitigate, we can't do nothing about, but if we can mitigate 80%, we can stop blood pressure in its tracks. Prior to the broadcast, you and I were chatting, and you suggested that uh, we, we would be well advised, particularly those who are prehypertensive, to make it a part of almost your weekly, if not daily routine. Check that, check that blood pressure yourself. Make it a part of your life. Yes, and, uh, and you would be surprised that resources are there to help people manage their blood pressures. The American Heart Association, and I'm sure other organizations are doing the same, we provide resources to churches and community organizations. We provide blood pressure screenings, and we have um, online tracking tools that help people track their blood pressure. And, and they can actually print out and take that information, because the blood pressure tracking on a daily basis tell a story. So when you go to, the, to your doctor and you have this history, the doctor is also likely to give you more attention because they know you have a stake in your health. Um, so it, 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 is, uh, it is incumbent upon people of this state to reach out to organizations like the American Heart Association and get the resources that we need to move this state in the right direction. Well, we, it, it might be useful to pause here. We got uh, Your blood pressure is measured by two numbers, one something over something. And most of us don't know what it, what it is. I'm sorry. It's at two levels of pressure, right? Who wants to do this? Who wants to give us the refresher? I can, quick, quick, I can please. do that. You have the top number, which is the systolic, and that is the the pressure, the measurement of the pressure that is exerted on your blood vessels when your heart squeezes. And then the bottom number is when the heart releases and it's the resting uh, pressure that is on your uh, vessels when, you, when your heart is in the resting position. Dr. Bala. Well, uh, I, I think too, uh, she uh, said it right. Uh, both the measures are important. The systolic, which is the top number, and the diastolic, which is the bottom number. And the ideal number is 120 uh, over 80. That's what we want ideally. And uh, for, more, uh, for most adults, if it crosses over 140, over 90, that's when we call it as high blood pressure or hypertension. Uh, of course, uh, when they have diabetes or kidney disease and other conditions, we need to be paying extra attention to the blood pressure. Ms. Grayson indicated earlier in the program that even a 10-point reduction in someone who has hypertension or prehypertension mm -hmm. A, a ten point drop a significant has reduction has recently. has exponentially greater mm -hmm. uh, impact mm -hmm. on one's mortality yeah. that, that's that's very true um, actually even a five point mm -hmm. decrease what the studies have shown is a five millimeter decrease in the systolic blood pressure the top reading uh, has uh, can decrease the the, the propensity to develop a stroke by about 15 percent mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, the risk of dying due to heart attack by 10 percent. So overall there is a net benefit for even as small as 5 millimeter mercury decrease in the systolic blood pressure. Are you advocates, anyone here advocating that we just totally abandon fast foods. I mean, I like my smoked meats. I like my yeah. chips. I like my mm -hmm. uh, salty soda pop. I like, okay, I'll exercise and I'll eat an apple every now and then. But well, how hard, can, how much work does it take to get that five points off, let alone the okay. ten? Uh, uh, and while we would do we love, have to do something really dramatic? Well, we would love to say cut out all things that are bad for you, but realistically that just won't happen. We, we we would like for all things in moderation. Right. Um, and so to make sure that you're not eating fast food every day throughout mm -hmm. the week, um, maybe once a week, um, decrease your sodium, make sure that you're paying attention to your diet daily, um, even jotting down what you eat just to go back and review it to see, am I eating foods that are higher in sodium? Am I eating foods that are higher in fat? 
So just being more aware of what you eat, what you take into your body. Yeah, some of us ask or miss Yes, yeah. it, absolutely. We need to let go of perfection mm -hmm. because when we when we make people feel that they must have perfection, they feel they'll fail, and that is. Uh, Part of the beauty of one of the diets that we have, that's one of the most effective diets, uh, called the DASH diet, it is not the type of diet that we just hand to someone and say, here's the list of everything you must stay away from. Mm -hmm. Instead, we have much flexibility, and especially a patient who can get to a dietitian, we can look at their lifestyle, see what parts of this DASH diet we can take to make it work for them. And studies show that even if they can't adopt it perfectly, every increment of that that they can adopt makes a major difference. And the beauty of the DASH diet is not necessarily that it's a strict low sodium diet, but the essence is that it works in foods and nutrients that have uh, magnesium, calcium, uh, potassium, which actually help in the regulation of blood pressure as well. So many things come together and you may have an individual that's not as sensitive to sodium, but these other factors will then help them. So the point is, there is flexibility and no one should feel that I live and work in a community where the only place is fast food. I don't have time. I, I can't do it. This is too hard and I can't stand the taste of uh, vegetables because we have techniques to get them around that. Well, I, I guess it's actually a matter, it goes without saying, that most of us don't know how much sodium we're taking in. We have no idea. We, don't flip, we may flip it over, we'll look for the cluster my case, I look for the cholesterol or the fats. Yes. And sometimes I buy it anyway and eat it anyway, but I don't pay much attention to the salt. 80% of the sodium that we eat is hidden from us. We used to tell people, take the salt shaker off the table, we, which we still do, but that's, that's just such a small portion. Uh, the <coughs> food industry because of all the processed foods we have and the multiple uses of salt and sodium in processing of food uh, makes our food system, if it's not a whole food, a fruit or vegetable, often just chock full of sodium. You could have one food pro product that would meet all the sodium you need yeah, in a day easily. Yeah, to put things in perspective, the national recommendation uh, for our, from several medical organizations is about uh, 2,400 milligram of sodium per day. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what uh, the national studies found is we take literally double the amount of yes. daily recommended mm -hmm. sodium uh, in our diet. And most of it, uh, as Christine said, ha is the, are the hidden salts mm -hmm. which we don't uh, no, or we don't think about that. That's in in every diet or any any product we intake. And the statistics are the same for Arkansas children, mm -hmm. including the youngest children. We have preschoolers that are eating. I mean, blowing blowing it out it, mm -hmm. twice what they should be eating. Ninety percent of our adolescents in Arkansas are consuming far too much sodium. A certain former governor of Arkansas was fond of, of noting that it is, and we've touched on this earlier in the program, it is much easier to uh, eat, it, it's cheaper to eat badly than it is smartly or, or to, to eat intelligently because the food that is the very best for us tends to be the most expensive food in the grocery store. But there are ways around that. I Anyone want to offer that? Um, well, and, and while it, it may be easier to go through the fast food drive through and buy the dollar menu, you can also get 
inexpensive frozen foods. You can get canned foods that are low in sodium or no sodium. And so there are options available and programs available that will help you to learn how to shop in the grocery store and shop healthily. Um, and so I think there are options that are available to, to help with the, um, with the expense of foods. And back to your point about changing behaviors completely, I think that when we focus on goals, we want to make sure that our goals are smart. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say smart, not like ABC intelligent, but specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time limited. We want to make sure that they are goals that we can actually reach and that they are specific enough that we can achieve mm -hmm. them. And so thinking about buying foods that are within our budget, you can always go back to um, the store and find foods that are in the um, frozen section that are just as inexpensive as the 99 cent menu. And well, actually, that is, um, please, Ms. Just, please. just quickly, um, a couple of things. Um, the American Heart Association actually even uh, goes further to recommend only 1,500 milligrams of sodium um, intake, which that puts the average person consuming almost three times <laughs> the recommended uh, sodium intake for good cardiovascular health. And uh, also to reference other things, okay, behavior change can only take us so far. So we also have to look at the social determinants of health that determine what is accessible to individuals. So we also have to look at our policies, uh, our legislative environments, and what systems are in place to allow, or even if the individual wants to make those behavior change, we also want to make sure that the environment is conducive to support those kinds of behavior change, changes. So this, this is a conversation that involves at the individual level, the family level, because when one person is needing to cut back on the sodium and the entire family is not doing it, that becomes problematic. And also uh, the the community and, and, and the whole state at large. So this this is a big problem that needs everyone at the table to look at it. Follow up on that, if you, if you would, Ms. Grayson, but I, I guess it's axiomatic that if, uh, uh, in, in families where the parent either or neither parent smokes, the odds that their children will smoke just fall mm -hmm. dramatically. Mm -hmm. So you talked a moment ago about the, the environmental aspect of, of this thing. Could you follow up on Is that what we're talking about? The parents should basically set the example here? Or? So at the, at, the, at the family level, yes, if the, the parents have to model the behaviors that they want to see in their, in their children. You can't just tell them, don't smoke or don't do this and turn around and do the same thing yourself. Or if uh, there is need, let's say the father or the mother has hypertension and there's need to reduce their diet. There is no way you want somebody can be eating a salad here and everybody is ordering a pizza. So at that level, this has to be a family effort. But also at the community and the state level, we have to have the systems in place that allow these individuals to make the right choices so that you find there are some, in some communities, the only place they can have access to buy foods is the convenience store. And at the convenience store, all you find are <laughs> these salty packaged foods. So even if they want to make the behavior change, the system does not allow them to do that because they don't have access to that. And also when we look at income inequality and all these things, I'll, uh, keep these people in a very sick state of... Uh, uh, of Sure. Yes, that is such an important point. And to reiterate that, there are communities with lower income individuals where you only have convenience stores mm -hmm. and those foods are, are priced to entice mm -hmm. them. In the higher income communities, it's much easier to find access, to find farmers markets. So some of the initiatives that we have tried to do or have done, have completed, are bringing more farmers markets to communities, uh, initiating a program with partners to um, allow participants who are on SNAP, also called foods, uh, food stamps to receive education and to double their spending power on fresh fruits and vegetables at farmers markets. So, and, and bring their kids. Bring their kids in, bring 
farmers markets to child care centers, bring farm to school to child care centers. That's how you get into the communities. Unfortunately, you do have the barriers that when you try to start a farmer's market in, let's say, the Delta, which we think of as a great place to grow, we have row cropping. We don't have the fruits and vegetables. So there's a systematic challenge mm -hmm. that makes it much more difficult for the people who need it Miss Grayson mentioned a moment ago there needs to be a social and I guess a clinical structure in place to help people. Well, here's here's a question from uh, an individual, a former public health nurse from Craighead County, who wonders why we cannot bring back uh, uh, to quote the. The department, why can't the department bring back the national health grant, which had public health nurses out in the community? talking about? Well, uh, that's a great question. I can respond to that. And uh, uh, this is a dialogue we've had at the Department of Health and at the state level as well. And uh, um, what we have done in the last uh, uh, few years uh, is use our public health nurses uh, and through our local health unit to uh, screen for people with uh, high, for high blood pressure and uh, uh, refer them to the community providers. And uh, a part of it is uh, there is, uh, the, as I mentioned, there is a lack of awareness among individuals that they need to go get checked for their blood pressure. And uh, because it's a silent killer and most of the people tend to uh, refrain from doing so until they have one of the bad symptoms. So we are using in the past a couple of years um, through the health department uh, because we have at least one local health unit in every county in Arkansas and all of them are staffed with the nurses and uh, I really believe that uh, the public health nurses who are in the rural Arkansas in the communities can make a big difference uh, uh, and we work uh, through our nurses in community education as well and increasing awareness about uh, um, you know not just uh, uh, the prevention which is important prevention is the key but also uh, early detection um, and uh, to uh, for the adults uh, to come in and check their blood pressure and find out if their blood pressure is high so that uh, uh, they can go back to see their physician and uh, get counseled for lifestyle modification or if needed medication um, initiation. Uh, Mapleville viewer telephones to ask, I do every, quoting, I do everything right, have no heart or artery problems, I avoid all the foods they say not to eat, yet I still have high blood pressure. What's at work here? Well, uh, um, I do not know that individual's age. Um, high blood pressure uh, there is a part related to the age as well. Um, as we all grow old, our arteries tend to stiffen up and uh, an individual uh, can get uh, the blood pressure high or high blood pressure uh, when they age and uh, uh, it in spite of having um, regular physical activity and diet. But what the good thing about uh, eating right and regular physical activity does is it decreases their risk of developing high blood pressure uh, and particularly uh, those which can cause uh, heart attack or stroke. A Clay Cup, Northeast Arkansas, Clay County viewer is fearful of the imminent loss of health insurance so is asking is there any kind of home remedy of maybe organic foods or whatever that might counteract mm -hmm. absent pharmaceutical relief is there any natural food that, that can help contain yeah I can start and then uh, our diet and nutritionist can pick up you know only half of management of high blood pressure has to do with medication the other half had to do with lifestyle modification, eating right, physical activity, and uh, quitting smoking. And, uh, you know, our nutritionist can pitch in about uh, the importance of lifestyle modification. Yes, de depending on the person, uh, diet can be the first line, mm -hmm. depending on the situation. And again, in this merges a bit that call in the previous caller that not everyone is necessarily salt sensitive as I mentioned those other nutrients that are uh, 
throughout your fruit and vegetable supply could be a factor. So it, I would encourage them to look for what is considered the DASH diet so that they don't end up on the internet with unreliable information. Uh, it, it can be a bit confusing, but if they look at the DASH diet and follow the basics, whatever they can follow, that should help them, even in an individual that's not mm -hmm. salt or sodium salt sensitive. Even in the absence of medication, yes. studies have shown that DASH diet, following that, can reduce up to five to ten millimeter uh, Dr. Abana, could in the you milk. tell the, our listeners what the DASH diet stands for? Oh, absolutely. The DASH is an acronym. It's the dietary approach to stop uh, hypertension. hypertension right. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the basic tenets of it is increasing fruits, intake of fruits and vegetables, uh, intake of nuts, and reducing um, the dairy products and Christine you might want to add yes the dash diet recommends 2300 milligrams a day not that we're recommending that people count that but that's really for anyone again as mentioned 1500 is preferable many people have difficulty with 1500 because it does not taste good to them so we have to be realistic about what tastes good to you you're, you're not going to do it now, we are born liking sweet. We're born liking fat. Salt is more of an acquired taste. And as we're children introduced to sodium, as we are eating out more often, as we're introduced to more uh, processed foods, we begin to want more and more and more sodium. So it's a process of slowing that back down. Perhaps a gradual decrease so that you can slowly begin to like those foods that taste a little less salty and you can find alternatives mm -hmm. that very much mimic what salt does. See, a lot of people don't know this, but many people taste your really healthy vegetables, your, your, your dark greens. They taste a bitterness within them. Not all people do, it's genetic. And salt takes that away. So those people are more likely to overdo the salt, but you can combat that with sour, with crushed pepper, uh, red pepper, uh, acidic uh, lemon. These kind lemon. of things. <laughs> and, uh, these these things can also counteract, and then encourage that individual to eat the the vegetables that they've perhaps been avoiding because they tasted bitter to them. A viewer on the opposite corner of, or on the northwestern corner <laughs> of the state, Washington County, wants to, is it possible to treat two ailments at the same time, hypertension and uh, cholesterol? Uh, oh, absolutely. The, I mean, most of the people, um, at least a half of the people with the high blood pressure has other comorbid conditions like uh, high, high cholesterol or diabetes or uh, coronary artery disease. So uh, it is uh, possible to treat uh, more than one condition, particularly when it's with the high blood pressure. Uh, if an individual is, as this Fulton County viewer indicates, he or she is acknowledged as being overweight, is, is there a target level of, of sodium intake that, that he or she should aim for? It's, we don't look at that so much based on the weight status. Uh, I will say if a person is trying to lose weight, obviously they're going to need to reduce calories. When you reduce calories, you reduce sodium. So if sodium is throughout our food supply, reducing calories reduces sodium. So you can get two benefits there. But it's not like a medication that you would say, you know, calculate the weight and determine the, the sodium um, uh, amount. Mm -hmm. To what extent, a Pulaski County viewer, to what extent can stress elevate blood pressure on a sustained period, And one, and two, once on uh, hypertension medication, 
is it possible for one's condition to improve sufficient yeah. to be removed from it? Yeah. Ms. Grace? Well, one of the things, what stress sometimes does um, is people tend to overeat. And, and what do they grab? The, the bags of chips and this and that, and those are foods that are loaded with sodium. So that in itself can elevate your blood pressure. When people are stressed, they are more they are more likely not to exercise and what does that mean so stress can do a lot of things uh, to you to your body it would seem that when you are stressed that would be the ideal time to exercise or am I mm -hmm. oh, yes. yeah stress can be uh, you know a cause of hypertension or a consequence of uh, hypertension so it works both ways but, and the other part of the question, in case I missed it, uh, once on a hypertensive medication, it's possible for an individual Absolutely. to improve enough to be... Yes, you, know, you could, because yeah. what, what, when you're on medication and you, you understand that lifestyle mod, uh, modification has a lot of benefits and you start your exercising, <coughs> moderating your diet and doing all these other things, then there are chances that you could uh, take your... No, I wouldn't recommend that you take yourself off the medication, but doing these things and in collaboration with your physician, they can either reduce the, the dose or completely take you out of it by doing these things. Yeah, Dr. It's, it's an incremental benefit, you know, uh, depending upon where they are in the hypertension, if they are um, in stage one hypertension, where they are between 140 to 159 uh, versus stage two, which is over 160, uh, or stage three or hypertensive urgency, which is over 180, uh, the incremental benefit of lifestyle modification spans across the spectrum. So one could, if they have, uh, they are in stage one hypertension through lifestyle modification, uh, as I mentioned, following DASH diet reduces up to five to 10 millimeter of mercury, following regular physical activity has about uh, can decrease up to five millimeter mercury. So there are um, benefits for uh, leading healthy life, eating right, physical activity, quitting smoking cessation, and uh, reducing the alcohol intake. So depending upon the spectrum of where their blood pressure to begin with is, uh, they can go without medication. But uh, um, as Nancy mentioned, uh, regardless where they are with their high blood pressure, there is value in continuing to uh, foster lifestyle, uh, uh, good lifestyle choices. Well, uh, since you walked us through blood pressure, we have a Jefferson County viewer who wants to know the ideal or the proper or appropriate position mm -hmm. to take when one is taking one's own blood pressure, both feet on the floor, lying down, sitting up, or well, do you, what do you recommend? Well, it's recommended that, uh, first of all, you, you can't be rushing in, maybe when or you may have taken coffee in the last 30 minutes so we we suggest or recommend that uh, you're rested you have not been exercising or taken caffeine in the last 30 minutes both feet flat on the floor and your back uh, supported rested um, and then your arm should be um, rested on on a on on some type of surface like a table and um, and then just relax and breathe normally and get your blood pressure taken. And, and the thing is, with blood pressure, sometimes some people have that white coat syndrome. When they go to the doctor's office, they, they are nervous and their blood pressure may yes. shoot up. Or your doctor is talking to you, which you're not even supposed to speak when your blood pressure is being taken. Yes. But the, the value of having blood pressure, doing your own blood pressure tracking over a period of time is, is very important because that those uh, trackings can tell a story and uh, help you figure out whether even your doctor whether the, the the numbers are being taken correctly a garland county viewer asks that someone explain the difference between if i'm reading it correctly malignant hypertension and regular hypertension well uh, thankfully we don't see malignant hypertension that much anymore Malignant hypertension is uh, a term which used to be used in the past for a hypertensive urgency or emergency, if you would, when an individual has relatively high blood pressure over 180 over 
110 and they feel have a severe headache, uh, some visual disturbance and feel uh, dizzy or they may pass out or have a, um, uh, in, uh, have a chest pain. So when, when an individual have a combination of these uh, symptoms of end organ damage, uh, either uh, with their heart or with their kidneys unable to pee and have a very high blood pressure, that's called the malignant hypertension uh, and uh, that's a terminology which is used in the past and thankfully uh, that has uh, decreased quite a bit but we do have a big problem of what the reader or the listener talked about regular hypertension there's nothing called regular hypertension hypertension is when your blood pressure is over 140 over 90 and uh, it's bad and as I said uh, there is a spectrum uh, it's a spectrum and as the blood pressure goes higher moves from stage one to stage two uh, to hypertensive emergency the increase of risk of heart attack or stroke or blindness or uh, kidney disease increases two questions here uh, that kind of run counter to this one is a from a disabled veteran in Johnson County West Arkansas and from South Arkansas mm -hmm. Cleveland County uh, both have report low blood pressure is it unheard of for them to take more salt or to what should they be concerned with in terms of their cardiovascular health well uh, that's a good question uh, in sense that uh, uh, certain individuals have a low blood pressure and uh, sometimes it runs in families sometimes uh, it's postural um, some when they lie down and suddenly get up for some individuals the blood pressure tends to drop and uh, unless it's very low when they feel that they are feel liking uh, they are going to pass out or they are feeling dizzy uh, then it's a problem for but otherwise if their blood pressure is uh, uh, you know anywhere in the range of 100 to 120 or uh, 60 to 80 uh, without any symptoms, they should be fine. From uh, Union County, we touched on this earlier <laughs> from the Nature Cookbook or whatever, but a Union County viewer has read that celery, presumably uncooked, is a very good natural means of moderating uh, hypertension. Are there other, A, do you concur with that, and are there other foods well, for example, tomatoes and apples are, are thought to help fight cholesterol and heart disease. Are there, are there foods that can be taken naturally, uh, fruits, vegetables, that will actively combat hypertension? Simple by their simple consumption. Fruits and, and vegetables in gen general because of the magnesium, the potassium, and the fact that they are low sodium in general, yes. Uh, the, a celery in particular would have much fiber and even though that may not necessarily be correlated with the blood pressure that all goes into what you were the, the whole um, the whole idea yeah. of cardiovascular risk um, uh, weight loss it's it's all working together so celery in particular is not one that would come to the top of my list but um, t tomatoes um, bananas uh, it, I mean many things that, that people will commonly eat it doesn't have to be an odd you know it, you don't have to eat seaweed uh, <laughs> although although it is healthy for you uh, but but uh, there's certainly nothing wrong with consuming the celery fiber is very good for you and I would encourage to continue that mm. yet try to look at including a variety of fruits and vegetables throughout the color spectrum because you get different types of nutrients from different colors hey, of fruits and vegetables. I'm sorry you've even got a cookbook available am I right? Yes yes so the Arkansas Minority Health Commission has a 21 day toolkit to help you modify your behaviors, incorporate lower sodium, lower fat recipes to help you um, not only lose weight but also um, monitor any or address any um, 
blood pressure, cholesterol issues. And so um, you can log on to our website at arminorityhealth.com and select the Southern Ain't Fried Sundays Cookbook um, program and apply online and we'll send a toolkit and cookbook um, that encourages incorporating our recipes as well as 30 minutes per day of a physical activity and it has some good southern recipes that everyone likes um, waffles there's a chili recipe um, spicy southern barbecue chicken and now so yeah mm -hmm. things that we we are, are used to eating here in the south but encouraging you to have um, low sodium Worcestershire sauce um, and to bake or barbecue um, grill your chicken versus the southern um, fried style that we're used to Dr. Bell, I had something we do. You, you get a can of beans that may have a sodium, canned food may have a high sodium. You can knock that sodium down pretty simply. Well, yes, oh. uh, you're right. You know, most of the processed food, particularly canned foods, are loaded with salt, primarily used as a preservative, and you can put it in a, a sieve and uh, wash it out, rinse it in the water, and uh, get rid of it. Ideally, I recommend to my patients to buy fresh fruits and vegetables but if the alternative is a canned uh, food I recommend them to rinse it very well before they consume now uh, both of them brought a good point uh, about uh, why uh, you know diet is such an important part and uh, in at the health department one of the things we promote through the to the physicians across the state is to provide team-based care for high blood pressure or for diabetes. What I mean by team-based care is uh, the physicians working with the team, with the nurses and dietitians in, uh, in managing high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And it's such an important thing because uh, uh, in a given time with the physician a patient spends, we don't have enough time for the patient uh, to ask all these questions because diet uh, and lifestyle play such a big role and uh, we encourage physicians to work with their team with the nurses with the dietitians on patients who have such challenges with managing their blood pressure where they know that uh, he or she can benefit a lot with the lifestyle modification and work with their dietitian or the nurse to educate them about what are the healthy choices what is a healthy diet as you mentioned um, there is a lot of uh, lack of awareness about what foods do I eat what do I I cook how do I cook absolutely Sorry. And just wanted to say, in addition to the coordinated care approach, also encouraging patients to write down any questions or concerns that they have so that when they come into the doctor's office and they have that white coat syndrome, they have those questions written down and they can make sure that everything is addressed. And tell us again how we can obtain the cookbook, the, the, the hypertensive smart cookbook. On our website at arminorityhealth.com. And the enough. American Heart Association also has similar resources with uh, healthy cookbooks and uh, all kinds of resources that are free to, to the community and they can as well go to the American Heart Association website or call the local office in Rural Rock and they should be able to get those resources as well. We've talked sodium, sodium, sodium and Ms. Sassy mentioned sugar as well, how even from in utero almost we're, we're oh, attracted to Well, is there a link between sugar, for example, and and hypertension that, that's even close to soul. Uh, that, that, that's something that may seem confusing because the DASH diet addresses avoiding sugary foods. That's not uh, in order to bring down the, the blood pressure. That's just a part of the entire diet that works together to lower that person's uh, weight status, it, it all works together. But the DASH diet does address uh, limiting uh, sweet choices to f five times a week. So uh, even so, DASH diet is hypertension diet, but it is used for many other things as well. So that's where sugar may play in there. And sugar is a tremendous problem in our 
society with our children. It, it, well, we have about two minutes remaining uh, in our broadcast. Let's go around the corner, starting with Ms. Grayson, if we can. What's the takeaway from tonight, from your standpoint? My standpoint is people need to get their blood pressures checked. That's the beginning. And after you get the, the blood pressure numbers checked, learn how to control blood pressure. I would say prevention is key. Minority health sponsors health fairs and free screenings. And so we are happy to partner with communities, churches, schools to make sure that those preventive screenings are provided. Yeah. Any change you make is better than not making a change. You will improve your health if you begin to change. And that can make you have that feeling of accomplishment and will help you go farther, but do as, as you're working with your health care team and working to get resources, do work if you can get a referral to a dietitian so that they can take what, what you need and tailor it because it can be done. Doctor, yeah, we'll close I, out with you. Yeah, I cannot emphasize enough uh, about the prevention because that is very essential to this problem we have. The second thing is uh, checking the blood pressure, you know, visiting with the doctor. We take our cars every 3,000, 5,000 miles for oil change. Our body is no different. We need to check our blood pressure and work with the physicians and uh, make sure that we don't have high blood pressure and end up with these heart attack or stroke. Well, we had a couple of calls regarding that and let me one one quick follow-up if I feel fine and I and I get some exercise and I watch my sodium is once a year enough for, for a blood pressure check <clears throat> See, well, I go for my annual physical well that's not enough uh, once a year is not at all enough uh, uh, the typical recommendation is uh, um, at least once in a few days uh, at least once a week I tell my patients once a week? okay yes I tell my patients even those without the high blood pressure well we all go to our grocery stores Kroger Walmart nowadays everything every store has a blood pressure machine just check uh, your blood pressure to make sure that it is okay it is in the acceptable range if it is not I think uh, Again, prevention is the key, and early detection makes a difference uh, between uh, getting a heart attack or stroke or may taking control of one's own health. Serious subject, splendid panel. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Thank, thank you for having us. Thank you for, thank you for, thank you for, for watching. Us. Oh, See you next time. Thank you. Next time on Doc Martin. You don't look as bad.